Well, good morning, Greens. It is wonderful uh, to gather together uh, in this time of COVID. I think sometimes we feel very alone. Uh, and I, I hope one of the great benefits of the time we spend together today is we'll realize we're not and that we are stronger together and uh, we're here for each other. So uh, thank you for coming. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq people. Now this territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Mi'kmaq, the Willastaque and the Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognize uh, the Mi'kmaq, the Willastaque and the Passamaquoddy title and establish the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. And I trust that we will uh, not only acknowledge this, but help it to be a guiding principle as we go forward. We're really fortunate to have our three provincial leaders together for this opening panel. And uh, I was thinking as I was getting ready for this today, how did this come about? And you know, as many good things are, came about over a few beers in a pub somewhere. Uh, I was up in uh, Fredericton and we were getting ready, and David may correct me on this, but I think it was for the 2017 election. And Lois Corbett, who some of you will know from the New Brunswick Conservation Council, Lois Corbett, a great thinker, said, you know, we need to start showing people there is great leadership in uh, the green movement. And so it was her idea we try and bring green leaders together in Fredericton to support David in that election, which we did do. And then David and I were having a conversation about a year ago, and David said, you know what, we're not pushing our governments to do enough regionally. And he then said to me, the federal platform in the last campaign didn't have a lot for the region either. And he was right. We, we, uh, we had good things in that platform, but we hadn't maybe gone out and looked at what the regions needed. So um, that planted a seed. And uh, I was meeting with the Nova Scotia Greens and said, is there something I can do to help us as we get ready for what is likely to be a provincial election here this year? Um, and we thought we want the wisdom of our cousins in other provinces. So here we are together and that's how we got here today. And so th the three leaders are going to discuss what they see as potential for working together. Topics that are regional in nature, but where we can support each other. And I, um, I'm gonna do this alphabetically. So I'm gonna start with Peter. And I, uh, I think Peter, you'll remember when you and I shared a ferry to come over to Nova Scotia from PEI uh, to join with 2,000 people to oppose the continuation of Northern Pulp, to say it is time to remediate Boat Harbor. And I know that that day I felt that regional support, that Maritimers had come together on one issue. And it's kind of a, for me, it's an idea of where we are stronger together. Just for those of you who don't know Peter all that well, but I think everybody does, uh, he is known for working together. I was looking back at your uh, background, Peter, and I didn't know this, that when you were in Ontario, you were pushing for the Genuine Progress Index and uh, instead of the gross domestic product. And even though you weren't elected, uh, you worked with a Liberal MP to bring in legislation that didn't pass eventually, but work together so that they would look at the Canada Wellbeing Measurement Bill. And uh, that tells you something about the nature of the person. Of course, the famous stories are that uh, when he came to PEI, he was elected in 2015 after having run nine times before that. Um, and then the first, uh, first MP, uh, Green MLA on Prince Edward Island, uh, the third in Canada following David Kuhn and Andrew Weaver, and then in 2019 made political history that we all celebrated when under his leadership he brought in the uh, first official opposition in a provincial legislature that was Green. So Peter, we're going to start with you. We'll give you a minute to tell us where you think cooperation goes. 
Thank you, Joanne. Welcome, everybody. Bonjour, uh, de l'île de Prince Edouard. Je suis très fier et très heureux d'être ici aujourd'hui. Um, Kwe Jelassi from Abagwit. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I'm looking at my screen. I, I see I'm only looking at one of five pages. Um, on this page, I see a number of people I recognize, and I, I see from the names popping up in the chat box that there are a large contingent of Ireland Greens with us this morning. So welcome to all of you. Welcome to everybody else. And Joanne has so eloquently explained that today, as far as I am concerned, is about connections. Uh, connections between us as a Green family, connections between us as a human family in this region and beyond, and connections between us and the natural world. And it's that recognition of systems and our place in those systems, which I think distinguishes in some ways one of the many ways that I believe that the Green Party uh, is distinct from the other parties that operate in, here in Canada. So it's, uh, it's absolutely lovely to be here today. I know I only have a couple of minutes, so I'll be very brief, and I know we have lots of opportunities for dialogue and people to talk together, and I, I want to get to that. I know we have a number of breakout rooms. I think there, the Atlantic bubble was perhaps the example of the community that we have here that already already exists in Atlantic Canada, a really distinct and discrete cultural and economic um, place, which while connected, of course, in all, in all kinds of ways uh, to the rest of our country uh, and beyond, there is there's something very discreet and special about the Atlantic region. And I think it's no surprise that the Atlantic bubble was as successful as, as it was and endured for as long as it did. And looks like it may well come back in the, in the very near future. And I think that is due to a commonality of values and principles and philosophies that guide people who live in this area. Um, and I think that, that those are very special things. I do think that there are ways that we can cooperate much more strongly and vigorously as a region. I think of economic uh, ways that we could tie ourselves together, harmonizing and raising employment standards, for example. David has been pushing for a transportation, uh, a regional transportation authority here, a sort of uh, maritime transportation authority, a regional crown corporation which is a really intriguing thought to me, transportation, of course, being an essential service, something which is essential for us as human beings, for our economy, for our rural communities, in order for us to live with uh, a, a degree of equity and, um, and of security and dignity. So I, I think there are many, many ways that we can work together, and we already are, but I, th I think the Green Party can play a particular role in bringing this region together economically, socially, and environmentally um, as, as a, a much stronger unit. I hope we talk about, um, we already have talked about Indigenous relations, and this is a very live topic, um, particularly on Prince Edward Island at the moment. Our house is sitting currently, and this week we have already brought up in the house um, the necessity of the moderate livelihood fishery to be carried out in a safe uh, manner here on Prince Edward Island and the announcement from DFO this week uh, gives me great a great deal of concern. Um, I think generally speaking a, an economy of the future, a green economy is one that's going to be much more local, much more regionalized um, and I, I think that clearly will necessitate a greater deal of, uh, of cooperation between the maritime partners. I think I'm going to stop now, Joanne. I'm already over my two minutes. I want to thank you, Joanne, for facilitating this. I, I want to thank, uh, uh, I think Judy and Krista have been enormous forces um, that have made this event happen this morning. Um, so merci, uh, and uh, I will speak later. Thanks, Joanne. Excellent, Peter. Thank you so much. And just a reminder before I go on to David, if you would like to be listening to this session in French, we do have simultaneous translation. If you go to the bottom of your screen, next to reactions, you'll see a little world and it says interpretation. And if you click on that, you can choose to hear this in French. 
Uh, so I just want to remind everyone that there is simultaneous translation for this session and the last session, and then there are options for bilingual workshops in the breakout. So now we're going to go to David Kuhn. Uh, of course, I met David first uh, when he was with the Conservation Council of New Brunswick and um, kind of the go-to person for everything uh, that was good for New Brunswick like the and the environment. He was an activist, he was an educator, and he was he was a good communicator. You, you always knew when you inter. I was with CBC, so when I would interview David Kuhn, I would get the straight goods, and not always a person who wanted to give me those easy answers. And uh, and I came to admire him a great deal. And it has been a joy in my life to call him a friend and a colleague within uh, the movement since then. He became leader of the Green Party in 2012 and uh, was elected to the uh, New Brunswick Legislative Assembly in 2014. Uh, the second Green to be elected provincially. Andrew Weaver was elected in BC and then David Kuhn. And uh, for those of us who were around then, it was an amazing breakthrough. Uh, and it gave us all so much hope. Uh, but I also think, and this was personally, I guess, because I'm a Maritimer and I was in BC at the time, it said something to the country. It said, you know, that we were progressive. We believed in putting our vote where our thoughts and values were. And I think David's always represented that. Uh, David's also a collaborative person, uh, again, looking back at his biography, and I won't go through all of it, but, uh, you know, he worked with the commercial fishermen's organizations to, uh, to establish the Bay of Fundy uh, Fisheries Council. You know, that's the kind of collaborative person David is. And if you, you talk to him about during COVID, working under a conservative government, but with uh, the other parties to make sure New Brunswickers are well protected. And I think um, that has been certainly noticed and appreciated, of course. Uh, after his election in 2018, we had a provincial election in New Brunswick where we had uh, three green MLAs um, and the party is growing. Uh, so David Kuhn, over to you. Uh, you're, you're on mute. There, the first time we've done it this time. <laughs> I think I'm going to have a t-shirt that just says you're on mute. Voilà, merci Joanne. Uh, bonjour à tous et à toutes uh, aujourd'hui. Je pense que c'est très important aussi de, de comprendre que quand nous, euh, nous pensons de notre région, euh, nous pensons de, de la, le, le, le pays de, de, de l'Acadie, le pays des Acadiens et Acadiennes dans chaque province qui, qui habite chaque province euh, de notre région. Donc, um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, today and uh, speaking to you from the uh, unceded territory of the Wolastikway uh, people and uh, and the former uh, village of Point Saint Anne in Fredericton. I um, this is a we only have a brief moment, but um, let me say this: that that globalization has not been kind to the Maritimes. Um, the level of cooperation among our three provinces is probably at an all-time low. The Council of Atlantic Premiers uh, is a mere shadow of itself. It pretty much, uh, well, does very little other than manage uh, its legal responsibilities for the, the Maritime Har Atlantic Har Harness Racing Association and, and uh, the Maritime uh, uh, organization for, for higher education, um, and then organizes a few meetings among the premiers on a schedule. Um, so what, what strikes me is uh, prior to globalization, as has been the case uh, through various waves, the, 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 the direction or trajectory that uh, we were heading in many ways was towards uh, something that lines up with the values of so many people in the Maritimes, uh, whether First Nation, Acadian, uh, or, uh, or other settlers, is uh, the commitment to um, greater local self-reliance, community-based economic development, uh, and, and a, a, a connection to the environment that is actually borne out in what we do every day and how we farm, how we manage our, our woodlots, uh, how we fish, 
and uh, carry on our, our business um, at the level of our communities and the level of our households. Uh, that pretty much got blown out of the water by globalization, but it does represent in so many ways um, the real green deal, the green project uh, for our region. And, and we've got broad shoulders to stand on uh, in our history, um, whether it's First Nation, Acadian, uh, or uh, Anglophone, we have, um, and I, have got, I haven't got the time to kind of set that up, but, but, but it's the case. Um, and it's, it runs through each of our provinces. Uh, and we need to recapture that and build on it uh, to, to um, help move our region forward uh, to a real green deal for, uh, for our communities and our people uh, and for the environment here. In, in our region. It requires some institution building because while the values, uh, uh, I think of most Maritimers uh, and peoples in the Maritimes line up nicely in that broad way where uh, on, on, on one hand, uh, an awfully independent bunch, but on the other hand, we care deeply for each other and, uh, and work together when necessary. Uh, and that's always been the tension, but um, it's, a, it's a great basis to move forward. But to do that, we need to build some institutions uh, that, uh, that help move us towards a real green deal, whether it's on transportation, becoming more self-sufficient in renewable energy or food, um, or moving our, our economy towards one that's fundamentally based on, on local enterprise, um, small business, cooperative, social enterprise. Uh, that, those are the kinds of things that we need new institutions to to work towards or, uh, and I guess, renovate existing institutions that are region-wide to better serve those purposes. So I'm sure I am over time, but merci beaucoup. Um, <laughs> lots of, uh, well, anyone. Well, Alan, thank you, David. Uh, and, and now we'll go to Thomas Trappenbird. Uh, it, Thomas is, is known as kind of the, the well-known face of the Greens in Nova Scotia. I mean, he has a long history with the Green Party, both federally and provincially. Uh, he uh, served as the inaugural president of two uh, federal EDAs here in the province. Uh, he represented Nova Scotia on the Federal Council of the Green Party of Canada. He has run as a federal candidate and a provincial candidate since 2006. You may be starting to push Peter Bevan Baker's record, Thomas. I don't know. <laughs> I think you should take uh, And, uh, you know, but he also has a day job. He's a professor of computer science uh, at Dalhousie University, holds a PhD in physics and uh, is well respected around the world, not just here in uh, Canada or, or Nova Scotia for his pioneering work in um, intelligence and computer learning and uh, loves motorcycles, is a star uh, at karate. Uh, there's so much about Thomas when you get to know him and uh, he is of course the leader here in of the Green Party of Nova Scotia and we're hoping because we have an election coming up where he will be running in South Shore St. Margaret's, never forget to get the political plug in, uh, that we're hoping we will have that breakthrough, that we will have a green voice here in Nova Scotia. Thomas. Thank you so much. And, and yes, the next election will be my 10th election, Peter. So I, I can't beat you, but uh, at least I hope to uh, be on par in how many times I run. Anyhow, uh, thank you all so very much that you are all here. Uh, let me start by pointing out that I think we are all here because we want to address the climate emergency and because we want all beings to have a decent living. This goal requires actions on all kinds of levels. Greens are a big family, as Peter pointed out, and this is true on a global scale. I was just in contact with a Green member of the European Parliament and a German Green MP um, about the LNG plants in Goldboro. Uh, and no, Germany does not support this as it is sometimes uh, uh, made the impression now here. Um, here. Here's another example of green collaborations. When we were so worried last year about the violent dispute about lobster fisheries, I was so happy that Anime reached out and she, um, as she has considerable experience in nation to nation talks. I was so happy that she wanted to hear our take and she respected our suggestions. 
In addition, Jenica was able to chime in with very thoughtful contributions. This was really important for us here. But let me thank in particular to uh, the New Brunswick and PEI uh, Greens. David and Peter actually came to our AGM some years ago when Jessica Alexander and I were confirmed as the leadership team um, of the resu uh, resurrected GPNS. And the fabulous energy of your teams have been a strong motivator for us. It was just wonderful. Many of us have seen, have been there during the elections and uh, this is a really big motivator for us. We are now at the point where we need your active help. Uh, I give you a particular example. As you might know, the federal government announced on December 10th uh, of last year that all open pan fish farms on the West Coast must be gone by June 2022. In contrast, there are plans to drastically increase fish farms in Nova Scotia. We are wondering why our Atlantic coast is worth less than the BC coast. One of the main operators in Nova Scotia is actually Coke Aquaculture, which is from New Brunswick, and we know that, of course, you have similar situations. Moreover, the ocean has a strong federal mandate, and it is hence important to bring the fed, uh, our federal cousins into the mix. Just to be clear, the Green Party of Nova Scotia calls for an immediate ban of open, fish, uh, open pen fish farms in Nova Scotia. However, I want to close by pointing out that Nova Scotians have developed much more sustainable alternatives. So Greens are not just against things. It is true that we are against destruction, but we are all for promoting solutions that are good and where our future economy are. So thank you everyone for being here and I'm looking forward to further discussions. Thanks, Thomas. So this gives us the opportunity to get into specifics that all of you have raised. So I'm gonna ask you to, the, the three leaders to turn on their mics because you may want to sort of jump in. I'm not gonna make this super formal, but let's start with uh, the transportation authority, David, that you've put on the table. Can you give us some idea of what you think that could look like? Well, as we know, public transportation in the region is, um, is, is pretty rudimentary. Yeah. Uh, and we would have very little um, to link us up uh, among our communities without a uh, maritime bus. Um, and that's a PEI based company, of course, and, and uh, they're quite committed to the region and trying to provide transportation services. But we need to build something uh, out from there that is more comprehensive, that is seamless, uh, linking uh, local transit with intercommunity transit, with interprovincial transit. Um, I imagine a, a system of building off of Maritime Bus to help them expand and deliver more service, connecting that with rail. Uh, and when I say connecting that with rail, we have to take our rail system back from via rail and create a regional rail system that actually meets the needs of, uh, of uh, everyone in our region um, in a way that, that makes sense and uh, is not tied to uh, some national agenda where we're at the tail end of a, a supposed national system that doesn't function anymore, but actually meets our needs for transportation, meets our needs to really tackle um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the imperative of reducing car transportation related carbon emissions uh, to create a, a, a comprehensive seamless network of public transportation in the region it would be some kind of a Crown Corporation um, that uh, I think of as the Maritime Transportation Authority and it could bring ferries into it as well. Uh, Peter, do you want to add to that? It, do, you, do you see PEI fitting nicely into that? I mean, Maritime Bus is based there and uh, it, it strikes me that being able to connect well to, for example, the train in Moncton would be an advantage to islanders. Uh, how else do you see that benefiting PEI? Oh, absolutely. Um, of course, transportation and mobility is an essential service. Uh, Prince Edward Island is um, simultaneously the most rural uh, province in Canada with over 50% of our, our, our um, citizens living in rural areas, but we're also the most densely populated province in Canada because of our small size. And we have never had any sort of comprehensive public transportation system here. 
Um, only very recently have we established transportation systems, even in our uh, in our more urban centers in Charlottetown and Summerside, with some very um, fragile and and uh, sort of inconvenient connectors between them. So the provincially here the, the, we are, as David used the word, rudimentary, and that's exactly where we are. But we also have to recognize the connections. Uh, the, beyond Prince Edward Island to ensure that islanders have those opportunities to, when we go off the island, um, have seamless transportation links to the rest of the maritime region and also the rest of the country. We've, uh, and Maritime Bus has a role to play there. It's a private company here in Prince Edward Island run by um, a, a gentleman who has a very strong commitment to continuing um, access to transportation here as a, uh, and it's, it's critical for um, economic development here. It's critical for rural vitality. It's, cri it's critical for equity. It's also critical as part of our climate um, action policy. Um, as we move people out of, uh, out, out of ind independent individual cars into more public transportation, we have a, an incredibly exciting initiative here on Prince Edward Island where the, we are in the, at the beginning of replacing our entire school bus fleet with electric buses. Um, of course, that's a wonderful thing in itself, but those buses are also going to be used as part of a public transit system here on Prince Edward Island. When they're not transporting children, they will be used as a public transit system in the way that uh, occurs in some other jurisdictions like Scotland, where I'm from. So th there are some exciting things happening here. Lots of work left to be done, but I love David's idea of a regionally managed um, authority uh, like a, a regional cr um, crown corporation which could oversee this because relying on a public, uh, I'm, excuse me, on a private provider as we currently do for our bus service, which is really the only uh, public transit that we have here in the region, um, it, is fragile um, and they are, they, it, we need to do better. Sorry, I'll pass it on. Yeah, well, and, well you know what, I, I hadn't heard about uh, the school bus initiative. That's, that to me is creative thinking. Uh, uh, Thomas, I'm going to go to you. I mean, here we are in Halifax right now where we had a proposal, and I saw Richard Zorowski was on here, to have our buses replaced with electric buses, and then they decided, no, they could go back to diesel. It seems transportation is something that Nova Scotia is lagging behind if I hear what these two provinces are doing. What's your sense of how we would fit into uh, a maritime transit author transportation authority? Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to point out. I, I saw Richard uh, Trowski, um on the call. He was a councillor in, in the Halifax uh, HRM uh, council. And um, while he was there, uh, they decided to actually order electric buses. Uh, unfortunately, it's not anymore on the council. And guess what? Uh, this was cancelled right away. And uh, we ordered again diesel buses. Uh, very sad. Um, there's so much more than just, you know, just having electric. The we know, we know it is coming. We know that our infrastructure will completely change. And I think it's now really a responsible thing to do is to look into the future, especially at this time. Uh, in the Maritimes, there are some corridors, the, the, the South Shore, in the Valley, um, where we could establish uh, much more intelligent transportation. Uh, we uh, see a lot of doubling of our highways and uh, we were wondering, you know, is this really the best uh, um, uh, form to, to, to spend the money? We believe in infrastructure. Now is the time to look into the future and to have this. So I also like very much the idea that if we can link this much better within the maritime provinces, this would be something so good for, for all Nova Scotians and for all Maritimes. Okay, let's move on now to um, that institution building that David talked of. So one would be the possibility of a Crown Corporation that would deal with transportation. Um, would you use, David, and everyone just sort of a quick thought on this, would you use the Maritime Council of Premiers or the Atlantic Council of Maritime Premiers? Would you use that institution or would you create something, because there's only four employees there. I mean, they, they don't have much capacity uh right now and three of them are administrative they have an executive director and that's above it so is that the institution to build up or is there another one to look at david do you want to start that we'll just do a quick one two three i believe it is uh it needs to be built back up it needs to be renewed it needs to be reformed um it has drifted dramatically from its uh, early days 
in terms of both its mandate and the kind of work it does. It has two, $2 million sitting there, for example, cash surplus. So there you go. You got a little bit of money to actually uh, expand right there. Good time to go uh, after them. <laughs> it turns out they actually have an annual uh, financial audit statement, which one can look at, but otherwise you can't really find out what they're up to much. Uh, but uh, it needs to be rebuilt. But it really speaks to the atomization of of uh, our region, um, not not only because of globalization, but also I think because of Harper's uh, you know reign when he um, basically refused to deal with anyone except on a provincial basis. So uh, I, I think the provinces, the provincial governments, the provincial premiers got used to being right. well, dealt uh, with. I'm not on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and uh, that, that also I mean, it's, it's where we are because we haven't seen the kind of moderation in our premiers in this region. Just, that, just that and David, somebody's got their mic on. Okay, we got you, Phil. All right. <laughs> uh, Peter, what do you think? Uh, the Council of Atlantic Premiers, can we revamp it and use that $2 million? Good for David for finding it. <laughs> Absolutely. I really don't have a lot to add to what David just said here on the island. Because we are an island, I think the, there tends to be a, a less talk. Uh, we, we tend to be more independent, perhaps even more insular than the other provinces. And so the idea of, of that regional cooperation is not something that gets talked about very much here. Um, that was something I was not actually aware of, David, that there was there was two million million dollars sitting in a, in a fund there waiting to be used. So um, it's not it's not a large part of the conversation here on the island, but I absolutely see the value and utility in bringing it forward. Can I just say, um, before yeah. I stop speaking right now, um, uh, we have a caucus of eight here on Prince Edward Island, and I see that seven of them are on the call right now, which is amazing. Um, and I know that the other one um, is with her two children at the farmer's market right now. So um, <laughs> thank you all, all my Green Caucus for being so engaged and hardworking on a Saturday morning, a beautiful Saturday morning, I might say. Well, I, and I want to say thank you to PEI Greens and, and Jordan for, uh, Bober, for being so supportive of getting people together on this. So just a nod. And uh, Jordan will be leading the transportation breakout room if you want to talk more about this. Uh, Thomas, I'm not going to start with you on the Council of Atlantic Premiers, because I think we've kind of agreed that they could be used and they're located in Halifax. So maybe you and I'll have to start lobbying them. Uh, but uh, I'd like to, to move on now to energy because I don't want to run out of time and not talk about this because I know the three of you are pretty good experts on talking about what do we do collectively to improve meeting our targets. And since unfortunately Nova Scotia is the laggard in this, I'm going to start with you, Thomas. Uh, let's talk about, you know, our new premier says, oh yeah, we're going to get off coal by 2030. And um, we if you look at his plan. It's not exactly robust. <laughs> so what do you think we could do? <laughs> so, so let me start by saying, uh, of course, I'm happy that he, he is saying this. Uh, I actually ran against him and he always assured me how green he is and that, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy if you know, everybody would be green, um, but it is indeed now even more important to hold people responsible and really to look into that. Um, liberals tend to um, think that uh, burning our, our uh, forests is renewable energy and, and this is very concerning. Um, I want actually to point out that we have so many so many opportunities here. You know that the Maritimes, uh, a lot of people think it's, it's cold here, we must be very north, we don't have a lot of sun. It's actually wrong. We have uh, the, the, um, the index for the, the, the sun index in the Maritimes is uh, very high compared to many other places where they have already implemented a lot of um, solar energy. So we have real opportunities here. And, and energy is such a, will be such a critical part for, for many things. So, uh, we, we are moving into an economy with a lot of automation where really the currency of, of, of you know, running this and participating is in energy. And, and here is therefore, um, it is also something where we have to bring this to the local communities. This, we have some examples here in Nova Scotia where uh, some of the municipalities have uh, still their right to, to, to uh, produce their own energy. And uh, there are fabulous, uh, uh, like in Bridgewater and in uh, uh, I think is part of it, uh, show that we can, you know, they can really benefit from this. So energy 
is of course a green energy clean energy is a very very central part and we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, a lot of other people have shown already that this creates jobs this creates more local engagement and wealth and and this is what we can uh, implement here in the maritimes David, of course, there's efforts it, to not only keep Baldoon open, thank you, Susan for O'Donnell for pointing that out, at keep burning coal in New Brunswick until 2040, but the federal government seems to be leaning quite heavily to supporting small nuclear. I mean, you're already the province with a nuclear power plant, an old one, uh, and it, it's, it kind of boggles the mind that they're willing to put millions of dollars, federal dollars into that. I mean, I see that as probably one way Greens can help you is make sure that doesn't happen. But can New Brunswick be part of seeing us at least having an electricity grid that brings us some of that green energy from Quebec right now through to the rest of the region? Again, I, 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 I wanna to speak to institutions because we all know we have tremendous potential for, uh, for moving uh, massively to renewable energy both in electricity and, and using uh, the tremendous organic wastes that are produced in our uh, fish processing and food processing industries uh, around the region and in our municipalities as well as they are doing in Quebec and Quebec is a good example um, what's, of what's possible but here in the Maritimes one well, Atlantic Canada there have been negotiations going on among the governments uh, behind closed doors around uh, the Atlantic Loop and a regional energy strategy um, which most of us have not been party to. Um, it should be happening in the context of a, an open, transparent, and public institution, uh, so that the public can be part uh, of of that that discussion. Um, the there are important things they're talking about. I mean, just basic things like we need to improve the the transmission between uh, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick to maximize our our potential to utilize. Uh, renewables uh, like wind throughout the region. Um, and the PEI was recently uh, updated in terms of its connection to, to the mainland. But um, all of that is happening behind closed doors and that's extremely frustrating. It's one of the few areas where there is some kind of cooperative uh, effort going on and um, we need to be party to that and we're not. And that, that again, reflects the, the um, the recent history of, uh, of uh, uh, our various premiers in this region not really wanting to um, collaborate. Peter, um, how about on PEI? Are you being invited into these discussions? Um, yesterday, I, uh, the premier was asked a series of questions on this in the house actually, and he brought up the Atlantic loop that David just talked about. And that's a phrase that I had actually, I, 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 I was ignorant of until he had mentioned it in the house. So that the the lack of openness and public input in this is, is quite extraordinary. Um, I, I wanted to take a step back here, Joanne, and say that if you ever doubted that having a green presence in a legislature has an impact, you need to look at the change in how energy policy on Prince Edward Island has evolved over the last five years. Uh, my first year in in the house, we were still planning to spend millions of dollars to build a diesel generator as a backup facility here on Prince Edward Island. Thankfully, that never got built. But um, and the electric the connection that David just talked about the under the underwater cables, which uh, tripled the capacity of Prince Edward Island's connection um, to the mainland, was a was a huge investment that occurred over the last couple of years. And we've been making that transition. And the, the electric school buses are an, are an example of that. And of course, we've always been a leader when it comes to wind power. Over thirty percent of PEI's energy comes from wind, and that's that that will continue to go. But Dave, uh, Thomas, I think it was, also talked about the solar uh, potential here on Prince Edward Island and in the region. And one of our MLAs, Steve Howard, uh, has two pieces of legislation which will actually be tabled on Tuesday next week um, to modernize and further electrify the, the grid system here to encourage that, that dispersed, that um, distributed grid that, that we need to develop here. Uh, so there is huge potential on Prince Edward Island, and of course, the, we, we don't have many natural resources here. Uh, we have wonderful soil, we have, we have the oceans around us, and we have a great wind and solar regime. So in one of the areas where we can become more independent, both 
speaking provincially here and regionally, I think energy is one of those. Uh, we currently get here on Prince Edward Island about 60% of our power from New Brunswick. So the policies that are, that are adopted in New Brunswick have a profound impact here on Prince Edward Island. And of course, being a, a much smaller member of that conversation, uh, I think it's important that we push for greater energy independence here on Prince Edward Island, but also in the meantime, um, be part of a more regional move to cleaner, greener electricity and, and, and the electrification of everything, basically, which is what we have to do. Um, and, and for that elect electricity to come from clean sources. So PEI is absolutely a leader in that. And I can tell you the the um, climate change goals that we have set here, which lead the country by a long way, again, um, in large part because of the green presence in the PEI legislature and the and the all of the things that, that are happening here are as a direct result of having Greens in the legislature prodding and pushing and pressing um, one of the old parties to actually join the 21st century. I think, Peter, and um, some of this will be discussed in breakout rooms, but we're seeing that on several levels. The federal government is now talking about possibly funding a guaranteed income or a basic income project on PEI, again, because, you know, Greens have been pushing hard for that and said, okay, let's get ready to be the province. And I, I do think that the Green presence, we see that from with David and the mighty trio, we see it from your official opposition. I mean, Thomas said this at the beginning, but this is an important message for every Green going into an election, is Green voices make a difference. And, you know, you're proving that every day. Thomas, Nova Scotia is, um, when it comes to sharing energy, and we'll wrap this up here, but, you know, it has to go through New Brunswick to get to us in many cases. <laughs> and um, so working together with New Brunswick, and it does seem that when it comes to energy, New Brunswick is that central piece putting a lot of pressure on David and Megan and Kevin, but I think we can help them if, if we're beside them saying this is not just about New Brunswick, right? Uh, do you see Nova Scotia being able, I mean, our new premier gave us, uh, you know, which was great, um, rebates on electric vehicles, but of course the pushback instantly was we don't have enough green electricity to make that <laughs> valuable. And yet there are groups working right now in Nova Scotia to get that green electricity here. So Thomas, what finally, what do you think we can do collectively? Yeah, so I, I should say that I actually um, uh, participated in some of uh, webinars, which were actually organized uh, in New Brunswick. There, there were, there's a lot of studies there. So I'm learning, I always love when, you know, people have already studied a lot of these things. We don't have uh, to reinvent the wheel. I think we're here to let people know that we, you know, that this is the future and this is, the, there are uh, solutions which we can do. Um, in terms of, so, so working with uh, the Maritimes, I mean, we are a big family. So this is, this is uh, actually a lot of fun to, uh, to do this, that we are, uh, it's still working locally, but, but together with the Maritimes. Um, I should say with the, uh, you know, I, you mentioned that I work a little bit on machine learning and these kind of things. Uh, An intelligent grid is a, fascinating fascinating area um, there is so much we can do just with you know intelligent routing um, especially with renewables there will be a lot of things we have people uh, here who can, who can work on these kind of things so there's a lot of new um, opportunities here uh, huge opportunities which we never had we had in the oil economy you know things had to concentrate on the on the west but here we have really opportunities now this is our age and we are all about, you know, let's, let's take it. Let's go there. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move on from that. Uh, sounds like there's lots of areas to work on. I, off peak hours, I'm just seeing in the chat, there's talk about, you know, how do we improve our energy efficiency? I, Elizabeth May used to constantly say, we refuse to go after the low hanging fruit. Let's use less energy to start with. And, and we saw that in COVID. I mean, you know, oil companies discovered when we weren't driving so much and we weren't flying so much, wow, look, they had to start stop investing in fossil fuels. Like it's, it's not using it helps. Um, so let's move on to two quickly things that you both brought up or all three of you brought up. One is fisheries, which is that federal provincial tension. Uh, and it overlaps right now with indigenous rights. Uh, we'll start with Peter, David and Thomas, Th Thomas will end with you on agriculture, but 
Peter, as you see this um, decision by the federal government to go ahead with a food fishery, um, a moderate livelihood fishery, uh, this has been a big issue in Nova Scotia as well, as you know. Is there a way to work together on this? Absolutely. Um, Bernadette Jordan, the federal fisheries minister, describes this as a new path, but actually it's not a new path at all. Um, I spoke with the, um, the Mi'kmaq organization here on Prince Edward Island that negotiates with the federal government on a nation-to-nation -nation basis on issues like moderate livelihood fishery. And uh, I was shocked to hear that they were not consulted at all, at all, on this decision. Um, it's uh, for the, f I, I made a statement at the house yesterday on this actually, and we know that, that, that what the indigenous people are asking for is legal, it's constitutionally affirmed, it's part of the peace and friendship treaties dating back to the 1700s. And there's such a lack of understanding in our community and, and I'm, a, I'm sad to say um, at, at an elected official level as well, certainly here provincially, and, and I'm sure that at a federal level, the, the acknowledgement that Canada has so much work to do when it comes to understanding the relevance of these treaties, even though they're 300 years old, um, the ancestors on both sides, on the Indigenous side and the settler side, are we are all treaty people, we are all signatories to those documents. And Canada has yet to acknowledge and understand the relevance of, of, that, of that statement. And the minute, uh, I, I could go on for a long time on this. But I, <laughs> think right, I am going to watch our time here. Yeah. The opportunity for regional cooperation here is that the Green Party can be an ally for the Indigenous people in a political climate where allies seem to be very short, short uh, and yeah. few and far between. David, uh, how is this playing in New Brunswick? I, I guess I hear more about PEI in Nova Scotia. Uh, is this resonating? Is it an issue there? Well, it's playing out more quietly, but it's, it's, it's certainly an issue. Uh, there's no question about it. And there will be um, um, First Nation communities who will be launching livelihood fisheries uh, uh, this year. Okay. So well, there have been some, but more. So um, this is why it's so important for us to work in solidarity with the uh, First Nations uh, in our region and our provinces. And uh, as Peter sort of introduced, as Greens, we, we have strong um, relationships with the First Nations here in New Brunswick um, and uh, the, the key players, as well as within the uh, non-native uh, commercial fishery, um, both in the south in the Bay of Fundy and, uh, and uh, in the north. Um, thanks to the Governor Arsenault's great uh, work in, in connecting with the uh, fisheries and fisher, um, fishers there. So, um, you know, we're in a good position uh, with respect to this issue, but I, I, I do want to just add a little bit more to this fisheries question. We need to think about fisheries in terms of local food as well, and in terms of local economic development. We, while the lobster fishery dominates and it's one of the few fisheries that is really healthy and, and in place, and lucrative, um, we need to also have an emphasis on uh, restoring uh, other fisheries um, from a community-based perspective at that scale to integrate them into a local food strategy uh, to create more diversity for, for the fisheries and for our fishing communities uh, and to support our local food strategies. That's absolutely essential. Um, I've done work on this in the past and as you would mention in the introduction, um, the, the the, the, I am I'm not, I am not uh, prepared to allow the other fisheries just to disappear completely, which in a way they, they have. Uh, so we need to bring back the ground fish fishery at a community scale. Um, we need to try and sort out how we get the herring fishery uh, back in the Bay of Fundy at a scale that, that is uh, viable. So anyway, th these, are, these are some of the things that I think beyond um, uh, a particular issue with First Nations, which is important. You mentioned we need to think about in terms of fisheries uh, uh, from a, a green perspective in the region. Yeah, and uh, you know, I remember what we called the war on the water at the time in the Miramichi off Burnt Church. At the uh, and and really, I think New Brunswick can actually show how some of this can be worked out. You have some of the agreements 
for uh, moderate livelihood that the other provinces should be looking at because the First Nations have sat down at the table. I'm, I'm really surprised it's not being used right now. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up with Thomas because then we're going to have to take our five minute break. So two minutes, Thomas, on fishery and Indigenous peoples and that alliance, All right. that an ally. <laughs> <laughs> There's of course so much to say, but uh, yeah. yeah, let me start with uh, just the, um, the moderate livelihood fisheries and the particular the things we had last year uh, with the which it, uh, which Atlantism, um, you know, the announcement on Thursday by Minister Jordan really concerns me. It is, it is, you know, it's getting again. It's it's to a point where uh, it had the, the First Nations have not been, which I make here, have not been um, consulted, and we are again going down the wrong route. We are, you know, not one versus the other. It's here. I want to make very clear that. All this came together because the inaction of a government, and uh, uh, this is really what is sad to see. Um, I should say fisheries in general. This is, a, of course, a very, very important uh, uh, part of our economy. Um, we have a very traditional uh, way, which actually turns out to be very uh, sustainable. We had um, long ago a lot of problems with, with uh, uh, ground trawling, which destroyed a lot of uh, uh, our our fishing grounds. Uh, we finally learned that we have to do things better. Um, we have here an active, uh, small inshore, privately owned fisheries who have been fighting for years to stay independent, which is fantastic because they are they are practicing local sustainable fisheries. Um, but I'm very concerned about that. We are you know that uh, some of the larger companies uh, are actually less even monitored. The ocean is under tremendous stress. We know this, we have some of uh, uh, leading scientists here um, in, in the Maritimes uh, which have predicted, we have already lost half of the biomass in the oceans. We should be all really scared. So my point is here, again, there are solutions out there. Um, but because I work in this intelligent systems, actually there's a lot of, lot of work done on new kind of intelligent equipment, which has less stress on, for example, the marine life. And so there are so many opportunities. And I, I really think that uh, green participation in our government could help us to, to make these kind of positive changes uh, possible. All right, right on time. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you to Peter Bevan Baker, David Kuhn, and Thomas Trappenberg for this lively discussion, which I actually think is setting us on the roadmap to uh, what we will be talking about in our breakout rooms. So just a reminder, I'm going to get Krista to give us a few instructions. Uh, take a break here. So five minutes at 10 o'clock, we will aim to open our breakout rooms. Um, few things to remind you of. After our breakout rooms, uh, the facilitators are going to try and bring back a couple of ideas. We won't be sharing those with the whole group right now. We're going to actually prepare a report and send it out because after the uh, breakout rooms, we're going to hear from Jenica Atwin. Jenica has been a strong force on the federal scene as a Green MP from Fredericton on these issues. I mean, she has spoken strongly uh, about the moderate livelihood. She has spoken strongly about the need to not go to nuclear again, to go to renewables. So Jenica will be here and then following Jenica will be Annami Paul, our federal leader. So uh, I hope you'll all come back from the breakout rooms. That's my sales pitch. Stick with us right to the very end. 